All right, so we are now officially opening the Open Meeting Law Refresher. Welcome, everybody. I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Again, I'm Catherine Dimitrick. I'm Executive Director of Northwest Regional Planning Commission. A couple of things before we jump into the presentation. I just wanted to set the stage a little bit for tonight. I'll probably talk for about 20 minutes. I tend to give a high-level overview of the important facts of the Open Meeting Law and then we will open up the rest of the time for questions where you can talk about your particular situations, get advice from each other or advice from me, and we can um, move forward and all learn together through the conversation. I am not an attorney, so what I say to you is not legal advice. I am simply a planning practitioner with 30 years of attending thousands of open meetings and organizing thousands of them myself. So my advice to you is based on that experience and not legal advice. There'll be a ton of time for questions, but if you have a burning question as we're going through the presentation, please feel free to jump in and ask that question. At the end, when we're all done, you'll all be getting a copy of both the presentation and, the video, and a link to the video, and they'll both be posted on our website as well. And I'm gonna post in the chat right now a link to a survey that I hope you have the opportunity to fill out at some point that helps us learn to make sure our presentations continue to get better and serve the needs of our towns. Any questions before we get started? Okay, well, I will share my screen then and we will get started. Okay, just figuring out how I can get, see who's here too at the same time so I don't leave anybody stuck in the waiting room. Okay, I'm all set. Thanks so much for your patience there. So again, welcome to the Open Meeting Law training. The Open Meeting Law to me is something that I think is a really important part of Vermont's governmental structure. It's something that can seem intimidating, but it's nothing that you should really be afraid of. It's really something that we should celebrate and we should honor. Its goal is to make sure that government is transparent, government at all levels, whether it's the state level or the local level or the micro local level, <laughs> and really make sure that citizens have the opportunity to understand the decisions that are being made by local officials, state officials, and um, everyone who works in the government. So the open meeting law has some key components. It requires all meetings of public bodies to be open to the public. And we're gonna break down what all of those three things mean, what meetings are, what public bodies are, and what open to the public means. But in general, it means that for all of your meetings, you have to provide advance notice of the meetings, including letting people know it's going to be discussed any business discussions and actions have to be taken in these open meetings and members of the public need to be allowed to attend and participate. And finally, minutes of those meetings, a record of those meetings have to be taken and made available to the public. So how do you know if the open meeting law applies to you? So let's break down those three, those key components. First, what is a public body? The open meeting law applies to when public bodies meet to discuss business. So a public body is right here. It's any board, council, or commission of the state or one of its political subdivisions. And that's where municipalities and all of their departments fall in is these political subdivisions of the state. A key part that's important to remember is it also applies to any committee, any subcommittees of these boards, councils, and commissions, regardless of size. So if there is a subcommittee of a select board, it doesn't matter how big that subcommittee is, it becomes a public body in its own right. 
And so if you think about what a public body is, then you have to think about what is a meeting. So when do, the open meeting law applies when there's a meeting. So a meeting happens when a quorum is gathered. So a quorum is defined as a majority of the members of the public body, regardless of vacancies. So if you have a five member library board and you have two vacancies and only three members are around, then all three members have to show up in order for you to have a quorum of the board. The purpose of that gathering of the quorum has to be to discuss business or take action. So if a majority of the members of the planning commission should find themselves at a Christmas party together, that's not a meeting, as long as they're not talking about an upcoming plan revision or zoning bylaw update that they're working on. And I really hope they're not at a party, but sometimes that does happen. Uh, so just remember that it's a majority of people gather together for the purposes of discussing businesses or business or taking action. It's important to note that the gathering doesn't have to be in physical presence. So it doesn't mean necessarily that everybody's in the same room together. If you have email conversations of a, with a majority of members of a public body and you're discussing business, then you're actually having what would be considered a meeting. And since you're doing it in private, and with no notice to the public, that would be a violation of the open meeting law. So it's really important that you don't have reply all email conversations about business that is coming before your public body. There's some really narrow exceptions to that. Um, one really important one is that you can have a conversation to set an agenda for an upcoming meeting. So you could have a reply all email conversation or um, text chain where you're trying to figure out, well, what would you like on the agenda this month? And do you have any business that needs to be discussed? And that can be done via email, but that's really one of the only narrow exceptions to having email conversations with a majority of board members. There's some question about whether serial or daisy chain communication might also be considered a meeting under the open meeting law. So where a chair might poll individual members in advance of a meeting, let's just say, to find out what a decision might be before they want to put something on an agenda. There's some question about whether that would be considered a violation of the open meeting law. So it's not something that I would recommend. And then something to be really careful of is things you might not think of um, that you might get involved when, with online. For example, group editing of a Google Doc if it's, for example, a new policy that your board or committee is working on and you edit it together in a Google Doc and you're sharing information and comments and having conversations through those comments, I think you're getting close to the line of potentially violating the open meeting law, so I don't recommend that. And then also be careful of social media. So. If you have a town Facebook page, for example, and a citizen posts that, you know, I'm so angry that people are speeding on, you know, town highway number 37, and a majority of the select board members weigh in on the comments and say, we should really lower the speed limit on that. Well, then you have a majority of the board members weighing in on a business that goes before that public body. So just be really careful when it comes to online editing, social media, text messaging, serial and daisy chain communications. Are there any questions about what is a public body or what is a meeting? Can you, hi, Catherine, it's Chastity with hi. FiberWorks. Hi. Um, can you talk about like what scheduling works best for a meeting with the whole governing board too? Is that like the same thing as the agenda that's acceptable or? Okay. Yes, you can do that. So, so you could set the meeting dates and times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you. that like administrative pieces of when you're going to meet and what's going to be on the agenda. Right. Yeah. I was like, discussed. that could kind of get difficult if you can't, <laughs> right. you can't ask that. Surprise. Here's a meeting. <laughs> yeah. Thank great you. question. Thanks, Chastity. All right, next up. So what types of meetings do public bodies have and what kind of notice is required? 
So there are three types of meetings, regular meetings, special meetings, and emergency meetings. So regular meetings are when they are just like they say, regular meetings. The regular day and time is set either because it's in your bylaws, it's a resolution that the board's made, or it's in an ordinance sometimes. And so it's the planning commission meets the first and third Thursday of every month. That's your regular meeting. And citizens, members of the public know because that's your regular meeting and that information is available. In those cases, you have to have an agenda that's posted and made available to the public 48 hours in advance of the meeting. So for regular meetings, the agenda has to be available 48 hours in advance. So special meetings are two different types. One is for boards that don't have regular meetings. So if you're a board or a committee that only meets as they need to or doesn't have a set day or time, then when you meet, it's considered a special meeting. Or if you're a board that does have a regular meeting schedule, but you have to meet outside of that regular schedule, then those would be considered special meetings. And in those cases, there has to be notice 24 hours in advance to members with a posting of the agenda 24 hours in advance of the meeting. And then finally, the last type of meetings that public bodies have are called emergency meetings. And they are just like they say, they are only when necessary for immediate action. And in those cases, the only requirement is that public notice is given as soon as possible before the meeting. So sometimes that could simply mean taping a piece of paper on the door of the town office that says like select board emergency meeting to deal with fire at town garage and time and the agenda written in pen and taped to the, to the door. Or it could be that you have a little bit more notice and you could put something up on your town website or on your Facebook page, or if you have one of those message signs at the, at the town office and you're not meeting because your power's out, then you can do something like that. I also recommend if you have members of the press for whom you normally provide notice that you also try to give that public notice for an emergency meeting to that member of the press just because it can help alleviate any potential questions you might get about whether this was really an emergency or were you trying to hide something. And I will caution that emergency meetings are just that. It's not that you meet in an emergency because it's more convenient. It's really because you cannot wait 24 hours because remember special meetings only 24 hours. And so there should be very few times where you can't wait 24 hours in order to hold a meeting. Any questions about the types of meetings and the notice that's required? Okay, let's talk about agendas. So this has to do with the public having the right to know that you are meeting. The purpose of an agenda is to make sure the public can reasonably know what you're going to discuss at your meeting. On the agenda, the first action item of the meeting has to be additions or deletions to the agenda. If you don't do it at the beginning of the meeting, you can't do it later. The only thing you can do later is potentially change the order of items, but you can't add anything if you haven't done it at the beginning of the meeting. And if you think about an agenda being the public's reasonable right to know what's going to happen at a meeting, that makes sense. Because otherwise the members of the public could show up for the first item on the agenda, think all oh, the rest is a sleeper. And so then they leave and then you add something to the agenda that's not a sleeper item. Um, so there's a real logic behind that. And it's just really important in order to help yourselves remember that, it's really great to just put that as always your standing first item on your agenda. And uh, most of the time, there aren't gonna be any additions to the agenda, but just to remind yourselves that that's the place to do it. And then finally, the location of the meeting has to be on the agenda. So the agendas has, have to be posted in or near the municipal office in at least two other places that the town or your public body has designated for posting. And if you have a website for your public body, it has to be posted on the website within those time periods that we mentioned in the previous slide. So right now, 
we are working under some temporary changes to the open meeting law that run out July 1st of this year. So until July 1st, if you do a virtual meeting, the agenda has to include details for the direct telephone or electronic participation. And the word direct is intentional here. So you can't put on your agenda, you know, meeting via Zoom, call the town office for the link and the password. The actually, you have to actually be able to directly access the meeting with the information on the agenda. There is no physical location required for meetings. So uh, boards, all public bodies can meet fully virtually. And instead of posting in physical locations, uh, where we noted that at least two other places designated for posting, those two places can be electronic. So they could be websites of other organizations or other public bodies or public um, social media postings. So those are the temporary changes we're working under until July 1st. Are there any questions about agendas? I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said the temporary changes, the, the link has to be on the, at least two places and those can be electronic that changes after July 1st, after that it's, they've got to be physically posted. Correct. Okay. Just double checking. So after all meetings of a public body minutes have to be posted. So minutes have to be taken. There's actually very few requirements of what has to be in minutes. It's very simple. It has to be all the members in attendance, the names of other active participants, a record of the motions, proposals, or resolutions, and then the results of all votes. They don't have to be transcripts of the meetings. They can be super detailed or they don't need to be super detailed. It's really up to your public body. They need to reasonably reflect the content of the meeting so a member of the public could read them and understand what happened. Those minutes have to be available within five days. And if you have a website, post it on the website within five days. And then they have to be maintained on that website for one year. There's no requirement that minutes be approved by public bodies. Oftentimes, many of your public bodies have, as, as a regular agenda, approved the minutes of the past meeting. I think that's good practice, but it's not required. And so if you have failed to approve minutes, it, that doesn't make them any less official. They are still the minutes of your public bodies meeting. If you do the practice of posting the what's sometimes called unofficial minutes, they shouldn't be called draft. They would be the unofficial minutes of a meeting. And then you make changes to those. Just make sure you save the old version because that is a public record. So don't destroy that. You do need to maintain the old version somewhere so it's available in case someone asks for it. Are there any questions about minutes? Um, yes, this is Lisa Faring. I'm a little confused about the um, sort of the the requirement for unofficial minutes. Is can anyone submit them? Does it have to be submitted by a member of the body or? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so the minutes are the minutes are the responsibility of the public body. So they're either taken and posted by a member of the public body or a staff person that's assigned to that public body. Uh, but yes, they are they are the the job of the public body, not like a member of the public. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there is has there ever been any issues if there's contention about the unofficial minutes? Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, there have definitely been been um, fights in public bodies uh, when there is disagreement among members of the public body about whether the minutes are accurate. That has definitely happened. Um, in that case, 
it's going to be a situation of majority rules and the majority of members um, can take action about the minutes. Thank you. You're welcome. Catherine, we have a question here in the town office. Sure. Hi, town office. Hi. Uh, the first item under requirements available where? At the town office? Um, yes, or if for a town public body or wherever the the contact is for that particular public body. So if it's a the public body of the town, yes, at the town office. If it's you know the library board at the library, um, I'm trying to think of other public bodies that we might have. School board, it would be through the school. So whatever the whatever the the host is of that public body is where the minutes are available. Thank you. And they don't have to be like, it's not like you have to have a stack of them printed out and sitting at the counter waiting for people. They just have to be available upon request. Okay. So we're gonna talk about executive session now. So we've been talking a lot about member about public meetings and meetings that need to be in the public and available to the public so that the public can understand what's going on in um, meetings. There is exceptions to that and these are called executive session. There's one special exception to the open meeting law for quasi judicial public body, so the DRB when they're make, for example, or zoning board, when they're making a quasi-judicial permit decision, those don't have to be open meetings if a written decision is prepared. And that's really the only requirement. As long as a written decision is prepared and it's signed by a majority of the members, then those do not need to be open to the public, these quasi-judicial deliberative sessions. The rest of the exceptions but fall under- question. Yeah. But so then is that quasi-judicial or the written decision, that is public knowledge, right? Correct. That becomes the written record. That becomes okay. the record. Yeah. Yeah. And so the all of the other exceptions fall under what's called executive session. So executive session is a narrow exception to the requirements to meet in a public setting. So there's some key requirements. Number one is that you have to make a motion to enter executive session in an open meeting. So somebody has to make a motion, it has to be seconded and a majority has to approve to go into executive session. You can invite specific people to executive session, such as staff, legal counsel, people who are the subject of the discussion. Those will need to be named in the motion. So you would say, I move to go into executive session to discuss um, whatever the allowed reason is. And we're going to invite Corinne Julo, because I can see you on my screen, <laughs> to join the executive session. And someone seconds that, and you approve it. And then you go into executive session. You can't take any action in executive session except for real estate purchases. So other than a real estate purchase, any action that you take as a result of the discussion that you have in executive session has to be done in open session. I'm gonna talk in the next couple of slides about the, uh, the reasons you can go into executive session, but regardless of the reason, there are some best practices. First, the topic should be really listed on the agenda. So it shouldn't just say executive session. It should be, um, you know, potential legal matter, possible executive session, or, personnel matter, possible executive session. You shouldn't just say executive session. I have seen um, some boards where they'll say executive session if needed as the last item on the agenda. And I think that's fine if it's used as a landing point for saying, oh, this discussion has gone into territory. We shouldn't be doing an open, an open meeting. So we'll do an executive session later at the end of the meeting. But if you think you're going to go into executive session, the topic should be what's on the agenda, not executive session. When you do go into executive session, naming the provision of the law that applies is really helpful to protect your board 
And we'll talk about what those are next. And then if you're doing a hybrid meeting or a fully virtual meeting, it's good if you can have a system where you can place other participants into a waiting room so that they could wait and then rejoin the meeting when the executive session is over. So the reasons why you can go into executive session, there's two groupings of reasons for executive session. This first list, contracts, labor relations, grievances, civil litigation and confidential attorney-client communications, these require two motions. The first, the, the public body has to find, and this is straight from statute, that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage. So if you're going to talk about, let's just say, um, labor relations agreements with employees, because this has come up a lot in the board that I serve on, you have to have enough of a discussion about the matter. So our general manager would say to us, you know, we have a proposed change to the labor relations agreement. And I think there's some points that we should discuss in private so that we can, you know, retain an appropriate bargaining position in this conversation. So we've been provided with enough information as members of the public body to understand that this premature general public knowledge could place us at a, a disadvantage. So then someone would make a motion <laughs> that I find that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body at a disadvantage. That motion passes, and then someone moves to go into executive session to discuss labor relations agreements. So these, these items right here, do require two motions. First is the finding, and then the second is the motion to enter executive session. This long list here <laughs> only require the motion to enter executive session. So for all of these items, securing real estate, disciplinary action, student academic records, security or emergency response members, those are measures, those are presumed to need executive session and to be okay to discuss an executive session. I will highlight this one item here for you, which is the appointment, employment or evaluation of a public officer can be discussed in executive session, but the final hiring or appointment, including a reason for that has to be done in open meeting. So there's a very long list here. Many of them are specific. So parole boards, student academic records, um, rebate programs. <laughs> so there's some weird ones in there. Uh, but generally speaking, the, this list of items only requires a motion to go into executive session. You don't have to do the finding that we discussed on the previous page. Any questions about executive session? All right, so electronic meetings. So we're gonna talk about electronic meetings generally and then what you can do until July 1st. <laughs> so electronic meetings generally, they're allowed under the open meeting law for either members of the public or a majority even of the public body themselves to participate in the meeting virtually. Generally speaking, you must have a physical location open to the public where either a member of the public body or a staff member is present. And if you have anyone participating electronically, if the vote is not unanimous, you have to do a roll call vote. Now, the pandemic changes we've been living under since I think 2000 um, that expire in July 1st of this year say that you do not actually need a physical location. So until July 1st, all public bodies can meet fully virtually. And if you meet fully virtually, public access by telephone must be an option that you provide. And if you're a legislative body and a school board and you meet fully virtually, you must record the meetings. So those are the requirements through July 1st the flexibility to meet fully virtually along with those additional requirements.
So some additional requirements of hybrid and or fully electronic meetings. So each member has to be has to be able to hear and be heard. And members of the public must be able to hear and be heard. So both of those things need to be true. Uh, so some best practices is if you have safety features of the online services, use those. I think we're all pretty familiar with those now. And when you can, assigning a moderator to help run and uh, help run interference and manage participation is great. If you, um, especially if you're doing a fully virtual meeting, it's great if you can have a phone number that people can call that's listed right on the agenda if they have trouble accessing the meeting. And and this is a bit of an open question, that, but it's my recommendation that if the connection cannot be maintained, so not everyone who has been participating is able to participate because um, you know the Zoom connection dropped or the phone connection dropped, I think that you should end the meeting because you have, to me, that's like shutting the door and kicking a few people out of a physical meeting, which you wouldn't do. So try to think of electronic meetings as the same way. And then um, reviewing ground rules for participants in advance is helpful. And most of the electronic participation methods have closed caption options that you can enable for participants. And that's always a very helpful thing to do. So, so I have a question. So if, um, if you had to um, suspend the meeting because the connection couldn't be maintained, and you wanted to reschedule it, does that become a special meeting? That would most likely be a special meeting, yes. If you weren't waiting okay. for a new, for your next regular meeting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be a special meeting. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Uh, this is John Scutel. Um, how does uh, this affect uh, people muting themselves during a meeting? Uh, because they won't mute themselves or because, uh, well, they... if they're muted and uh -huh. so then they, you know, nobody can hear them and they forget to, you know, <laughs> unmute themselves. Yeah. As long as when they do unmute themselves, you are able to hear them. That's fine. And uh -huh. often the moderator of a meeting, like I can mute you right now and then I can unmute you. I can ask you to unmute yourself and you should have gotten a request. <laughs> Yeah, now I can't hear you. Now you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. That was a great question. Catherine, um, yeah. in regard to roll call, is a roll call required if a, if the all of the board is present physically and just the public is allowed to join in? remotely or is it any time you have a remote component a non-unanimous vote must have a roll call it's any time members of the public body are participating remotely okay thank you so if you're all physically present and members of the public are are zooming in and you have a vote that's not unanimous you don't need to do roll call okay All right, we'll keep going. So talk about individual and public rights when it comes to the open meeting law. So we've talked about a lot of these already, but I just think it's important to review them. So as an individual and a citizen, you have the right to obtain agendas in advance, be notified of meetings, view minutes, listen or watch recordings, attend meetings with accommodations if needed, reasonably participate in meetings, and then file written notice and civil suit alleging violations, which we'll talk about next. So I wanna just touch on this participate in meetings reasonably piece. So public comment does need to be allowed at all of your meetings, but it's not unlimited and it's not without bounds and you are allowed to set reasonable limits on participation by the public in your meetings. And you can do that either by having an agenda item that's public comment at the beginning of the meeting. You could have public comment on each of your agenda items. You can really manage it in any way that makes sense to you. And you can manage it and limit it in a way that maintains what's called reasonable order at your meetings. 
but you can't limit it in such a way that interferes with the public's right to participate. So you can't, for example, only limit public comment to residents of your town because nothing in the open meeting law says you have to be a resident of your own town in order to, put, to make a comment at a public meeting. You can't say, oh, there's 50 people here tonight. We don't have a lot of time, so we're only going to let the first 10 speak <laughs> and not let the other 40 speak. Um, so you can't place unreasonable limits like that on the public, but you can say, you know, everybody gets two minutes. You can say everybody gets five minutes, or you can say we're going to limit public comment to this one agenda item at the beginning of the meeting, and then we're going to move, move on. So you can place reasonable limits on it, but they just can't be unreasonable. So enforcement and correction. So if you violate the open meeting law, a couple of things can happen. You can recognize it yourself and then you can correct it, or someone can allege a violation of the open meeting law by submitting that alleged violation to the public body itself. So someone would write a letter or to the select board that says, I believe you violated the open meeting law on this date because of this. That public body then has 10 days to respond. And that response has to state how you're gonna cure the violation. And by curing a violation, you really have two choices. One is to ratify any decisions that were made in a way that is in conformance with the open meeting law or to declare a decision or an action void. So those are really the two options you have to cure a violation. And then the other thing you need to do within 10 days is to spe specify and adopt specific measures to prevent future violations. If the public body denies the violation, then you also have to do that within 10 days. And if you don't respond at all, it's considered a denial. If you deny or you don't respond, a citizen can file a suit within one year of the alleged violation. And if the courts rule that the violation was intentional, then you can be fined up to $500. I'm not aware of any of that happening yet uh, since this was put in statute maybe six or seven years ago. Uh, so I'm not aware where that's happened yet. I think in most cases, if there is a violation to the open meeting law, it's pretty easy to cure it. And also if there's a question about whether it's violation, it's kind of a gray area. Um, sometimes it's worth curing anyway. My recommendation to you, if you get a, a if you get an alleged violation of the open meeting law, if someone contacts your public body alleging that you violated the open meeting law, that you contact your attorney and get legal advice on how best to respond to that, just because there are legal ramifications, including the intentional violation, misdemeanor fine. So I think it's really in the best interest to contact your attorney. If you're a member of VLCT, you could contact VLCT and their attorneys might be able to help you as well. But that's my best um, recollection to you, my best advice to you. I've uh, I've definitely participated in some public meetings that have been um, a violation of an open meeting, and we realized it, and we stopped, and then scheduled another meeting and restarted and cured the violation ourselves. I was part of a state council about a month ago and somebody, a state employee started an email chain seeking advice on a policy that the that this council was supposed to adopt. And I was kind enough to remind them that we can't do that via email without being in violation of open meeting law. So all conversation was stopped. The initial conversation was a violation, but because we're now gonna adopt everything in public, in a public session that we're curing that ourselves. So there's ways to manage it yourselves no one's perfect violations are going to happen inadvertent or not. Any questions here? Yes. Respond publicly. What would you do? Call a special meeting? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. If you don't have a if you don't have a regular meeting that's within that coming up within that 10 days, I would definitely call a special meeting because to respond to it is an action of the public body. And so you need to do that in a meeting. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned as of July one, there's a bunch of special that there's a bunch of special provisions that that expire July first, and this is just a summary of those, which is that a public body can meet entirely electronically. You don't have to have a physical meeting place. You have to have technology that allows the public to attend, including by telephone. They have to be able to join a meeting directly from the agenda. And if you're a legislative body or school board and you meet fully virtually, you have to record your meeting. I'm gonna take a moment here to just let all of you know that the legislature right now is considering a new bill called S55, Senate 55. It did pass the Senate a few weeks ago and is right now being considered in the House Government Operations and Military Affairs Committee. It does a host of changes to the open meeting law that would go into effect after July 1st, that would essentially enable some bodies of the public to continue to be able to meet fully virtually and others not. It divides them between advisory and non-advisory. And if the bill passes in its current form, then select boards, school boards, uh, public bodies that manage budgets and tax rates, et cetera, would not be able to meet fully virtually but other bodies would be able to meet fully virtually like cemetery commissions or sometimes planning commissions if they're not doing any quasi-judicial work. So um, it's still up in the air, it's still a work in progress, but I did just wanna let you know that's being talked about. Uh, if a bill does pass this session that makes those changes, I am sure that there will be Secretary of State and Vermont League of Cities and Towns will do workshops and we will also work on doing um, some follow-up workshops as well to make sure everyone can be aware of the new changes if the bill passes. But if not, if nothing happens in the legislature this year, then all of these flexibilities here go away after July 1st. I'm sorry, you said that was uh, S55? S55, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to touch briefly now on a companion law to the open meeting law, which is the Vermont public records law. And this is, we're just doing this briefly. This could be a whole two hour session in and of itself because there's a lot to it, but I just wanted to touch base on it because there are many related things. So first, um, it, this applies to all public agencies. So similar to public bodies, most of the work that all of you do, this would apply to. And it just says that public records have to be open to the public. They have to be available for inspection and copying. And members of the public has a right have a right to inspect and copy public documents. The records have to be available during the regular office hours of the custodian of the records. So it could be that your custodian doesn't have regular office hours and that's okay too. They would just need to be available um, on mutual you know, mutually beneficial time for the public. And all public records have to be retained according to a retention schedule if you have one. If you don't have one, then the state archivist office has a recommended retention schedule that's pretty easy to follow. You could look up and see where you might fall under the type of records and they have a recommendation. And it's important to note that this applies to paper and electronic records. So if you use your private email address for, for business of the public body that you are on, you need to be saving those emails because that's a public record. If you do text messages as part of your work on a public body as a public official, that's a public record and you have to retain those. And it's these, this last point here that I always want to make. This is why I always talk about the public records a lot, because that's pretty important. I know a lot of people use their personal email for 
uh, work that they do in their volunteer capacity serving on a public body. And so it's just important to be able to retain and sort those. So if you get a public records request for all emails pertaining to the DRB decision of January 17th, 2023, you need to be able to go into your email if you have any. You shouldn't. All you should have is the agenda because you shouldn't be discussing it via email, but you right. want to be able to show that. <laughs> so that was kind of my question that like when, right, if it's just emails about the agenda and there's nothing else, then we don't have to keep those emails, do we? Well, those are actually part of the public record too. So you should keep those. I don't think anyone's going to give you a public records request for them. <laughs> so so everybody on the library board has to keep all those? Couldn't just one person keep them? Uh, one person could keep them to be able to respond to any public records request, but all people have to keep them. Okay. Yeah. Here's a silly question, but uh, public records must be open to public inspection and copying. Is that at the expense of the town? Uh, no, you can charge a reasonable rate to the person requesting the copies. This is uh, Lisa Faring. I'm a little confused about the the record keeping process for these text and these private text and email records. Mm -hmm. um, is there any sort of um, requirement for the the town to have a point of contact for these? Like if a member of the public was going to request a, a public record, mm -hmm. how would they go about doing it for for all of that? And then what would the town do? Okay. I want all of the text records related to, you know, the the enforcement of the dog dog keepers actions on this date. Yes. So, um, yes, the town can have a person who is the point person to collect and to take in that request for public record, collect it and provide it to the person who's requesting it. Um, when we get a public records request, the first thing I always do is call our attorney <laughs> to make sure that we respond in such a way that it meets the letter of the law. I'll tell you what we've done in the past is um, we have had people, so we have a lot of volunteers that we work with. So we've had them do like a search in their text bar for the keyword of the public records search, do a screenshot of that, and we provide that to show there's no text messages or if there was like a text message, we then show what it was. So we use that um, for emails, for, e for email responding to a public records request. We usually have a staff member on all of the emails. And so that staff member was able to collect them all because the members of the public body weren't emailing among themselves. So there's definitely ways that you can centralize it. Um, but if you're an all volunteer board and you don't have any staff, it's just important to think about this in advance so that you have somebody, your secretary, the secretary of the board or whoever is designated to be a person who's thinking about these things. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Here's a list of resources for you, the text of the open meeting law, um, a Secretary of State guide, VLCT resources, and then um, the Secretary of State public records law guide. And when you get the presentation, all these will be live links. So you'll be able to, to um, link on them yourself and go explore a little bit. So now we have questions. Catherine, I have three. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's more a confirmation, and I'm talking about um, DRB deliberative sessions. Mm -hmm. It's on the agenda, deliberative session. It's my understanding we do not need a motion to go into deliberative session. Is that correct? You should do a motion to go into a deliberative session, yes. Okay. Because um, that's a signal to the mem to the members of the public. That's a That's a record in the public, especially if you're leaving a public meeting to go into a deliberative session, then you definitely should do a motion. Okay. Best practice. When a vote is taken on 
an application in deliberative session. That's obviously private. When we come back in out of deliberative session and we're in public meeting, do we have to take another vote? Not if a majority of the members sign the written decision. Okay, so right now the written decision is signed by the chair or the vice chair of the, the DRB. So a majority does not sign it. So okay. we should take a roll call vote when we come out? Yeah, I think that would be a good practice. A roll call. Or just a or a vote is fine, like just a regular but, but Catherine, this is Lisa yeah. Faring. Uh, you know, the, the chair is acting on behalf of the entire board when they sign the decision. It's not yes, but if you don't have a decision in public giving the chair that authority, there's no record of because you made that decision in deliberative session, there's no record that the chair has that authority. So there's uh, nothing. Well, I mean, that's that's a part of our procedures. I'm giving you my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and lastly, um, in the written decision that we send out and is made public, it just says, let's say the board, you know, approved the application with the following conditions. Do we need to give the exact vote or can we just say approved? Do we need to no, say- No, you can just say approved. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. What other questions or interesting circumstances might you want to discuss? Angie, are you coming on camera because you have a question? Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm all set, Catherine. Thank you. Okay. I'm good. No, thank you're you. all set, Angie. Okay. Yes. Any other questions or thoughts? Thank you. You're welcome. There's a survey at the beginning of the chat. If everybody has a minute to fill out the survey, I would appreciate that. That'll help me make sure any future workshops meet your needs. A last call for questions before we jump off. No mm -hmm. questions, just a good presentation. Thank you very much. You're yeah, welcome. Thank you. thank you all for being here. It makes me happy that you're all here to learn about open meeting law. You thank all have, you. Have thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Bye -bye. Thanks, Catherine.